All right, so I would love to officially welcome you guys to our NCLEX Bowtie webinar. We are so, so excited to have you all here. Um, like I said, Amber's in the chat. She was an emergency room nurse for several years and then has transitioned into education and she'll be helping moderate the chat. I'm Miriam and I'm one of the nurses here at boot camp. I work with our other fabulous nurses to create cases, questions, and our video walkthroughs for you all. I've been a nurse for 15 years and as a new nurse, I worked med surge and hospice. I loved hospice, but knew med surge was not going to be the place for me, my permanent home. So I transitioned to the new life center where I've worked ever since. So I'm still in the bedside there. I work in the float pool and I get to do NICU step down, moms and babies, and go to the deliveries and take care of the babies there, which is my absolute favorite. I love a little adrenaline rush. Um, I know some people love OB, you either love it or you hate it, um, but that is my home. And then of course, my favorite nursing job is working here at boot camp, where I get to work with a fabulous team and help so many students prepare and pass their NCLEX exam. So we've been seeing a lot of feedback about bow ties and how intimidating they can be. And we're here to help you understand them during this webinar. So when you leave here, I want you to feel confident um, in how to approach the, this item type when you see it. So if you have any questions as we go, please submit them in the chat and Amber will be helping to answer all those questions. Um, as we go, I'll also be asking you guys questions just to interact with you throughout the webinar. So feel free to drop your answers and your responses in the chat and don't leave us hanging. <laughs> and I will share my slides and we'll get started. Okay. So first, here is what we're gonna be covering. So bow tie questions, we're gonna go over what a bow tie is, how it's scored, will I have a bow tie question on my exam, and then we're gonna get down and do one together and practice. So bow tie questions. Before we go into our bow tie question, I wanted to show you some important information about these next gen style questions. So it is testing on clinical judgment, which is really important. The NCLEX measures this clinical judgment and it's broken down into these six steps that you see here. So we have recognizing cues, analyzing cues, prioritizing hypotheses, generating solutions, taking action, and evaluating outcomes. That's a lot, I know, but we're gonna get through all these steps. We'll break them up as we approach our question and take it on together. Okay. So parts of a bow tie. So bow tie questions are just standalone items that measure clinical judgment. So we are given our instructions that are always the same. And then we are given scenario and data tabs. And that's gonna give us all the information that we need to answer the question about the client to determine what condition they're having, um, the different actions to take or interventions and the parameters to monitor. So those were the headers I was just mentioning. So just think of those actions as nursing interventions, our potential condition, which is the disease that they're experiencing, and then the parameters. So what we're gonna reassess or evaluate to make sure our interventions are working. You'll be given four to five answer choices. So in your first column here that you'll tackle first, your conditions, you'll have four options to choose from. This is always gonna be a potential condition. So you're gonna determine based on the information that you're given what the client is experiencing. And then you're gonna come over to your actions to take column and determine two interventions that you think you should take and then two parameters that you wanna monitor. These up here are where you will drag your answers. So you can see that that forms a bow tie, right? So that's where it's getting its name. So you'll drag up your answer responses and you have to complete all five boxes in order to proceed and move forward. If you have wanted to change your mind and already have two there, if you just hover over it, it will remove the one that you want. Um, or of course you can just drag and drop it down below. Okay. So let's go over some um, questions about if you should see this on your test, how it's scored before we get into strategies and our question that we're gonna do together. So these appear on the NCLEX after you've completed 85 questions. Um, they can also appear earlier as a pretest item. So the NCSBN likes to have 15 pretest items where you will, um, they just put out an item to see how it performs. Now, how it's scored. So the good thing here is that you can get partial credit. So you're gonna get one point for each correct response, of course zero if you have an incorrect response, but you can get a max of five points. Okay, so some strategies. I want you guys to take in these strategies and use them as you approach these questions. 
So you're gonna read the scenario and review any data tabs that are given. So here you can see this example, we have health history and vital signs, but you could have data tabs that are diagnostic results, lab results, assessment, progress notes, nurses notes, really anything you can see in the electronic medical record be fair game. So they'll put those data tabs there and give you this scenario. And as you read it, you need to break it down and determine what each finding is telling you. Is it normal and expected or is it abnormal and concerning? And just consider that as you go through. And then you're going to go and determine, look at these columns each separately and determine first what potential condition the client is experiencing based on the information. And I want you to approach each of these as a single best item. So, or as its own question. So this first column is your single best, you're picking one. And then you'll come over to your actions to take next and you're going to pick two actions or interventions to take. And this is like a select N. So the select N is going to be where you pick two. And then our parameters to monitor, you'll pick two also another select N where we're saying to pick two. And you'll pick two assessment options that you would like to take on for this client to see how your interventions worked. Okay, so let's use that information and go forward and look at this question together. So here's our instructions that you'll see on these questions. Complete the diagram by dragging from the choices below to specify what condition the client is most likely experiencing. Two actions the nurse should take to address that condition and two parameters the nurse should monitor to assess the client's progress. Now, I wanna point out that this says most likely here. So what does that mean if you see most likely? It's going to mean that all of these conditions are possible. So we're given some information about this client that makes it a possible option, but then maybe you're given another piece of information that makes it not as likely. So you're going to use that information to determine which one is most likely occurring. All right, so let's review our health history and our vital sign data tabs. And then after we review them, or as we review them, I want you to think through what is normal and expected versus abnormal and concerning. So a client is 34 weeks pregnant, she's a G3P2, and is being seen in the obstetrician office for a routine prenatal appointment. She reports experiencing mild lower abdominal cramping and a small amount of bright pink vaginal spotting yesterday evening. She also notes recent occasional dyspnea. The client reports a mild headache for the last two days and not feeling the baby move very much today. Now looking at our vital signs, we have our temperature is 98.2, we have a pulse of 80, respiratory rate is 20, BP 122 over 81, we're 97% on room air and have a two out of 10 headache. So thinking about that information, we move to our first clinical judgment step here, which is what matters most. And this is where we're looking at that middle column to determine what disease this client is experiencing or what potential condition. So remember I said to look at each finding to determine what's expected and not expected. So do you see anything concerning here? or hear me say anything concerning as we read this. So I see a few things and we'll go through, what do we think about this mild lower abdominal cramping and small amount of bright pink vaginal spotting that we see? So I'm concerned that this could indicate labor. Labor is defined as when we have uterine contractions that are regular and cause dilation and effacement to that cervix, and that's to prepare for delivery. So as that cervix dilates and effaces, it's gonna cause some spotting or bleeding, and that's known as bloody show. You may have heard that in school. So I am concerned about the signs of labor and see that she's 34 weeks pregnant, which is preterm. So she shouldn't have a baby. Preterm is anything less than 37 weeks. So keeping that in mind, after that, it can be late preterm. We really don't want anyone to deliver until 40 weeks gestation, but before 37 weeks is considered preterm. So what else did you see that was concerning? What about the dyspnea? Is anyone concerned about that? We see dyspnea, but our oxygen saturation looks good. Our respiratory rate is 20, which is on the high end of normal, but that's okay. I see that we have a mild headache being reported. She reports a two out of 10 headache. What do you guys think about that? Is that expected in pregnancy, not expected? When you see a headache in pregnancy, what kinds of things do you think about? 
Maybe you're thinking preeclampsia, right? Well, preeclampsia, which is a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, we look at the blood pressure, and if the blood pressure, blood pressure is over 140 over 90, we would be concerned about that. But because it's 122 over 81, this headache is likely just a normal pregnancy headache. And then what about this last finding that we see is that she has not felt the baby move very much today. Are we concerned about that or not? What do you think? So not feeling the baby move very much, maybe the baby's in a deep sleep state, something definitely to consider. All right, so now we're gonna analyze our cues and that means what could this mean? So what are we most likely experiencing here? So as we go through our answer options, like I said, the most concerning to me was that we have this mild lower abdominal cramping and the vaginal spotting as well as being 34 weeks pregnant. So I'm concerned about the preterm labor, but let's look at all of our options, of course, to make sure. So placenta previa, what do you know about placenta previa? What makes us consider that this could be placenta previa or maybe not placenta previa? So remember placenta previa is when that placenta implants low over that cervical opening. And that's gonna cause bleeding, right? But the bleeding with placenta previa is painless. So what happens, and yes, this is a stuffed uterus, um, is the placenta implants low over that cervical opening and it's either partially or fully covering it. And as that cervical dilation and effacement occurs, it can irritate those vessels and cause bleeding. But remember, it's painless. And this client was reporting some mild cramping, right? So we're not having painless bleeding here. Our next option is this pulmonary embolism. So a pulmonary embolism, we see here, it's a blood clot that appears and that's gonna block that perfusion and blood flow. Um, so we're not able to perfuse the body and oxygenate well. So what do you think about the PE? What's making us think that maybe there's a PE or what makes you think it's not a PE? We saw that we had the dyspnea, right? So definitely someone with a PE would have some difficulty breathing but we see that the client is 97% on room air, which is great. So I'm thinking that it's not a PE, but what could cause this? We also have this elevated respiratory rate, but it's the high end and normal. So looking at this image, you'll see that in, in normal people, not pregnant, when you inhale, your diaphragm is gonna contract down and that's gonna allow those lungs to expand. But in pregnancy, that gravid uterus is in the way and it's pushing up on that diaphragm. So the diaphragm cannot contract down and the lungs cannot fill with air. So dyspnea late in pregnancy is not concerning. If she was you know, early in pregnancy or her oxygen saturation was not so great, we would definitely be concerned. But here I'm thinking that is not the likely cause of the client's symptoms. Okay, and our last option to choose from is an intrauterine fetal demise. So an IUFD is when the fetus dies in utero and that is occurs after 20 weeks gestation. So what are your thoughts on this? Do our findings indicate that there's an IUFD? We see that the baby has not, or she has not felt the baby move much today. So we would have no fetal movement if it was an IUFD and, and this patient, maybe she just hasn't felt much movement because the fetus is in a deep sleep state. So keeping all that in mind, remember that we're finding what is most likely happening. So what do we think it is? This is where we prioritize our, our, our hypotheses. So where do I start? This is where we're going to make our final decision. What condition is this client experiencing? So we're thinking preterm labor, right? This client's showing us all the signs of this. We have cervical dilation possibly occurring, causing this bloody show to occur, and we have cramping, which could be our uterine contractions. So based on the information that we're given and know, that is most likely the cause. Okay, so now we gotta figure out what we're gonna do about this. So generating solutions, what can I do? This is where we make a decision for the interventions that we need to perform or prepare to perform. So our nursing process comes into play here, right? We've assessed, diagnosed, now we're gonna do our planning and implementation. All right, so remember that the NCLEX is a safety exam. So we need to find actions that are gonna keep the client safe in this situation. 
So if we have preterm labor happening, what kinds of things do we want to do? Maybe assess to determine if this possible condition is the most likely, like rule it, rule it in. We want to know, is it preterm labor? Maybe interventions to slow or stop the labor. So we'll keep that in mind as we go through and think of this next question, which is our select N we're picking two. So quantify blood loss, QBL, sure we wanna quantify blood loss and keep an eye on that, right? This is possibly correct. However, there hasn't been much blood loss and it's not gonna directly meet our goal of assessing if the client is in labor or slowing or stopping labor. So I'm not thinking that that's an option that I need to do. Assess for uterine contractions. Yeah, right, we wanna assess. This is gonna help us assess if the labor is occurring. So we can put a monitor, an external monitor on the mom called a TOCO, and that's gonna monitor those uterine contractions. So we can see the pattern and the frequency, see if she's having regular, regular uterine contractions, if that cramping is in fact uterine contractions. So definitely something that we wanna assess. Prepare to administer nifedipine. All right, what do you all know about nifedipine? So I might be saying blood pressure, right? And you're not wrong, but what about in labor? Nephetapine is a tocolytic, which means it's going to slow or stop uterine contractions. That's going to help us prevent this preterm labor or stop it from occurring. So that definitely seems like something we want to do. The next choice here is prepare the client for an abdominal ultrasound. So ultrasounds are gonna do things like assess the placental location, maybe assess for an IUFD, check on the fetus, but this is not gonna help us assess labor or slow or stop the labor. And our last option here is to prepare the client for a ventilation perfusion scan. So this type of scan is gonna assess ventilation and perfusion to the lungs. And there's two parts, right? We have perf Perfusion and oxygenation are two parts for this breathing. So air comes in and that's our ventilation and then oxygen has to get to those red blood cells and that's the perfusion piece. So there's different diseases that can affect how well the body does this. Um, and so helping that can help us understand what disease process a client might be experiencing. So looking at this next slide, this first image is showing us normal. So we see that ventilation, air comes in and then perfusion with red blood cells with oxygen. This image on the left is showing us issues with ventilation. So anything that prevents air from filling those alveoli and reaching the capillaries. So that could be fluid like in pneumonia. And so it's blocking it. Over here on the right side, this image on the right is gonna be a problem with perfusion like when we talk about a pulmonary embolism. So perfusion issues, the PE here, if we're talking about a pulmonary embolism, is blocking blood flow from reaching the capillaries and the lungs so they're not oxygenated. This client that would have a PE would have no breathing or ventilation issues, but blood flow is stopped preventing oxygenation of the blood. So this would definitely be assessed if we were worried about breathing this client, the dyspnea, if we were worried about a PE, but it's not gonna assess for labor and it's not gonna slow or stop our labor. So take an action. What did we decide? What are we gonna do? We are gonna prepare to administer nifedipine and assess those uterine contractions, right? And now we get to take on our last step, the sixth step, which is evaluating outcomes. We wanna know if what we did, those actions and interventions that we did, if they helped. Okay, so we're taking on this column as another select N where we're gonna pick two options. So we might do all of these things as nurses. Many of these you're gonna say, well, I would do that. But we wanna see what are we reevaluating to determine that our interventions were effective and for this client's condition. So hemoglobin is our first option here. What does hemoglobin tell us? It's gonna let us know if we're low on those red blood cells, right? This is great for clients that are having heavy bleeding. We would monitor it with the previa. Hemoglobin doesn't tell us if we've affected preterm labor process, right? It's not gonna give us that information. Respirations, of course, we're always monitoring a client's respirations, right? But it's not gonna tell us anything about this preterm labor. How about cervical dilation? So cervical dilation is what we're monitoring in labor to see if the client's progressing. So we would also be monitoring it if we were trying to stop labor, right? So our cervix here, 
what happens is as it dilates, the, think of it as a donut, okay? So the hole in the center of the donut is gonna get wider and that's cervical dilation. If you flatten that donut and squish it down, that's cervical effacement. So that's the thinning of it. So that process is what's causing bleeding or that bloody show when someone's in labor. So that definitely seems like something we would want to monitor, right? To see if this labor is progressing. Fetal heart tones. So fetal heart tones, we monitor with an ultrasound monitor externally, and it's gonna bring our fetal heart rate pattern that you see up here. And that's gonna help us know if this fetus is tolerating labor, how the fetus is doing during labor. That way we can intervene if we need to, right? So if we saw concerning fetal heart rate pattern or decelerations, we could give IV fluids, we can give oxygen, we can turn and reposition the mom. So we definitely wanna keep an eye on this to see how this fetus is doing during labor. And then our last option here, oxygen saturation. So of course, another important thing to always monitor on clients, but it's not gonna tell us about preterm labor progress, which is what we've determined as our answer. So what are we thinking here? Do we all agree we wanna monitor that cervical dilation and that fetal heart rate, right? The fetal heart tones. So remember, this is a safety exam. The two parameters we wanna monitor are a direct reflection of the interventions we've done. So looking back at our bow tie, we've determined the client has preterm labor. We wanna assess for uterine contractions. We wanna to prepare to give nifedipine or a tocolytic to stop those uterine contractions. And then we wanna evaluate the fetal heart tones to see how the fetus is doing in labor and cervical dilation to see if we have slowed and stopped and been effective with a tocolytic to stop the preterm labor. And we see that that's correct. Now, I hope you all feel more prepared to take on bow tie questions. We hope that you all picked up some new strategies and feel confident in approaching these questions. You're gonna do great. So here is where you guys can find us and Amber will be dropping this um, in the chat for you all so you have the link. So the top one is where we are on bootcamp, which you can log on there um, and the website has everything you need to prepare and pass for the NCLEX. And the other links are all our so social accounts so we can stay connected with you guys on your nursing journey. We are so glad y'all could join us today and it was so fun to get to interact with you guys. Um, we have a few moments, so it's left for any questions or comments you all have, feel free to drop them in the chat. You're welcome, I'm so glad that you all could join. Chris, no, at this time we don't have one-on-one -on -one tutor, but we are hoping to do more of these webinars and connect with you all and walk you through different things. Um, the signing up for the chance to win, so the num or the names will be pulled from this and um, it'll be announced shortly after in the Facebook group. I'm so glad it was helpful. So the link for the question bank, if you go to bootcamp.com backslash NCLEX, that'll take you there. And I think Amber put the links um, there for you if you scroll up in the comments. You're welcome. All right, everyone. Well, I think that is all the time we have for now. Thank you so much for joining um, and follow us on all our social accounts and go to the website and um, take a look around at the question bank and our case studies and everything that we offer.